one. You will hear a man talking to a receptionist at a hotel. First, you have some time to look at questions one to seven. Listen carefully to the first part of the conversation and answer questions 1 to 7. Good evening, sir. Do you have a reservation? Yes. Let me just check I've got everything. Um, sorry. Yes, a reservation. It's in the name of Hartley. Martin Hartley. Let me see. Oh, yes. Here it is. That's for three nights. Yes, that's right. Do you need my passport? I just need to take the number as a form of ID. No problem. Now, can I just ask you to fill in this registration form, please? Ah, actually, no. You see, I've broken my wrist. Yes, I noticed that. I'm afraid form filling is something I can't manage right now. Not without a lot of pain, anyway. <laughs> oh, dear. I'm sorry, sir. But don't worry. I can complete the form for you. That's very kind of you. What do you need to know? Well, let's start with your name, of course. So that's Martin... Um... Hartley. That's H-A-R-T-L-E-Y. Thanks. And your address? 45 Carlisle Way. Could you spell Carlisle for me? Sorry. It's C-A-R-L-I-S-L-E. You don't pronounce the S. <sighs> Carlisle Way. And that's in Lewis. L-E-W-E-S. And is there a state? I don't think you have states in the UK. No, we have counties. It's East Sussex. Sussex is with double S. The postcode is LW46AU. Do you want my phone number? Actually, no. We contact people by email now. Ah, yes. And send me lots of advertising, too, I suppose. <laughs> My email is hartleynitrum at yahoo.co.uk. Sorry, a bit slower, please. Hartley, my surname, then Martin backwards, N-I-T-R-A-M. That's all one word. And all lowercase? That's right, no capitals at yahoo.co.uk Thank you very much, Mr Hartley. And could you give me your passport now, please? Thanks. You can have that back now. Ah. And that's for three nights, so checking out on Sunday morning? Uh-huh. OK. You're in room 16. That's on the first floor, overlooking the courtyard. Here's your key... Would you like somebody to take your bag? Now you have some time to look at questions 8 to 10. Now listen to the next part of the conversation and answer questions 8 to 10. Do you have a map I can take? Yes, of course. We've usually got lots of them here. Somewhere. Ah, yes. Here we are. Thanks. Could you show me where we are, exactly? Um, let me have a look. Um, ah, yes. This is our street here, 
Avenida Constitución, the bigger hotels are marked, so let me just see which one is us. Um, here, yes, here. This is Hotel Columbus, just before you get to the museum. I say just before because that's the way most people get here. I mean, coming from the main square where all the buses stop, or from the station. Yes, that's the way the taxi came in from the airport. I thought we drove past the museum, though, just after we went through that big square you mentioned. Ah, you probably mean here. That's actually an art gallery. It's worth having a look round, but the museum's more interesting. I think so, anyway. Thanks for the tip. I hope I get time. Right, well, tomorrow I've got to be at the conference centre. They told me they'd put me in a hotel that wasn't too far away. Oh, yes. The conference centre's not too far at all. Let me see. Uh, yes, down here. You can walk there in seven or eight minutes. Just cross over the road and go straight down this street here. That will take you towards the newer part of the city. Walk on for a couple of blocks, and then when you get here, you just have to go right a very short distance, and then you'll see the conference centre above the other buildings. It's quite big. I see. That all looks quite straightforward. Thanks very much. My pleasure. Have a nice evening, sir. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to part two. Part two. You will hear a man talking about areas for growing vegetables in towns called allotments. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 14. Listen carefully to the first part of the talk and answer questions 11 to 14. Good evening, everyone. I'm delighted to see so many of you. I was going to start by saying that more and more people are seeing the value of growing their own fruit and vegetables, but now I don't need to. First of all, let me say that whether you have a garden or not, there are all sorts of benefits to having a plot of land you can call your own, and it will give you a great sense of satisfaction. OK, let's assume you have a garden. Chances are it's small. Most gardens in cities are hardly big enough for a few pots of herbs and a couple of rows of beans, now that's where allotments come in. A typical plot is around 250 square metres, big enough to feed the family for a year, big enough, too, to grow a whole range of vegetables, fruit as well, perhaps, not just cabbages and potatoes. Moving on to the social aspects of an allotment, how many people can say their garden is a meeting place? You might chat with your next-door neighbour every now and again, but allotments are notorious communal hives. There are usually between 10 and 30 plots on any allotment site, and they bring together people from all sorts of social backgrounds. Where else do you find a lawyer deep in conversation with a lorry driver? There's often a great sense of camaraderie with initiatives to involve the wider community, including the less able, the retired and the unemployed. 
In urban areas nowadays, people may have a tiny yard or a balcony, but it's not a garden. An allotment is a huge recreational asset for anyone in that situation. First of all, there's the exercise. Renting an allotment costs around thirty pounds a month. That's generally a lot cheaper than joining a gym. Then there's the involvement with nature. Watching seeds grow into mature plants gives so much pleasure and such a sense of achievement. Spending time outside in the fresh air boosts our mental as well as physical well-being. And one more thing: don't forget, allotments are also an enormous benefit to the environment. They provide invaluable green space in our ever more clogged-up towns and cities, making them more sustainable and appealing to live in. These spaces provide a habitat for wild plants, birds, insects, and occasionally bigger animals. What's more, locally grown food doesn't have to be transported long distances, and that helps to reduce road traffic and hence pollution. Now you have some time to look at questions fifteen to seventeen. Now listen to the next part of the talk and answer questions fifteen to seventeen. Now food, a subject we all like talking about. Because the main appeal of an allotment is obviously taking home all the freshly picked vegetables and fruit, so why is grow your own so good? Well, to start with, there's the superior flavour. Food you've grown yourself tastes infinitely better than anything bought in the supermarket because it will be super fresh. Another point in its favour is the range. These days. Gardeners are growing an amazing variety of vegetables on their allotments. Finally, there's the bonus of knowing that the produce you've grown is organic. You know that what you're eating wasn't grown on an industrial scale farm or sprayed with large amounts of pesticides. Now you have some time to look at questions eighteen to twenty. Now listen to the next part of the talk, and answer questions eighteen to twenty. Now I'm going to show you a typical allotment from the site closest to here on Finley Road. Let me just get this image up. That's it. Can everyone see? So, as you can see here, each plot has a fence around it and its own gate. Between the beds are grass walkways. That means you can walk in and around comfortably and not get your boots too muddy. There are soil beds on either side. This plot, in fact, has two smaller flower beds opposite a much larger area for vegetables. And there's also a glass house for growing tomatoes or anything that needs more warmth and protection. Here you can see one of those at the front near the gate. Most allotments have their own shed at the far end, as you can see. Allotments do need a water source, though, and there are stone sinks outside the sheds. A hose pipe can be attached to the tap for easy watering. Some of the plots have a pond, though they are not always popular, as they tend to attract insects. And this plot has a compost bin at the end opposite the shed for recycling organic waste. Right. So, how to go about getting an allotment? That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Now turn to part three. Part three. You will hear two students and a tutor discussing their plans for next year. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 24. Listen carefully to the first part of the conversation and answer questions 21 to 24. Hi Mark, how's it going? Oh, hi Lily. I'm OK. Have you decided what course you're going to apply for then? Yes, illustration. I've already applied to one college actually. I didn't even know there were places that did just illustration. There aren't many. Most combine it with other areas like painting and graphic art. Mm. Unfortunately, there are no courses in London, so I've opted for Birmingham. Mm. Birmingham? I'm not sure I'd want to study there. Well, from what I've heard, you're thinking of not studying anywhere, Mark. <laughs> Look, I haven't made any decisions yet, but I'm wondering what the point of carrying on at art school really is. I mean, why not just get a studio and paint? Aren't you enjoying art school now, then? Yes, I am. But this is a foundation course, isn't it? I wanted to try out all the different areas. You know, sculpture, computer graphics, a bit of everything. Now I know that I really just want to paint, though, I may as well get a studio and do it. There's nothing more for you to learn, then. <laughs> I didn't say that. This isn't all about a fear of being rejected, is it? I mean... I know you hate applications and interviews and so on. You're not looking for a way out of all that, are you? No, of course not. I'm no more scared of rejection than anyone else. I mean, people not buying your work, that's real rejection, isn't it? Now you have some time to look at questions 25 to 30. Now listen to the next part of the conversation and answer questions 25 to 30. Hi, do you mind if I join you? We were talking about next year and applying for courses. I couldn't help overhearing. What's this all about then, Mark? Is it true that you're thinking of not continuing at college? I'm looking at other options, yes. I've been reading about artists who claim there's no real advantage in learning formally. There's this Scottish guy who just went to Paris and got a studio. He's doing really well now. In fact, one of the fine art students here dropped out of her course at the end of the first year and just went to Prague. She loves it there. Hmm. You might just be looking through rose-tinted spectacles there, Mark. There are plenty of people who regret taking that route, you know. For every artist making a living, there are 20 living on the breadline. OK, I take your point, but I'm thinking about the cost of three years at art school as well. Apart from the actual fees, there are all the living expenses. Students are running up at least £30,000 debt by the end of their course. So this studio you're planning to get... I take it that'll be free, then. <laughs> if you're contemplating working in Paris or Prague, won't that cost practically the same over three years? Maybe, but I'd be selling my paintings, wouldn't I? In fairness, Mark, very few artists start selling work just like that. Yes, but will studying for another three years mean that I will definitely be able to sell my work? It won't guarantee it, but it'll make it more likely. In my opinion, anyway. Mm. Remember that there are plenty of artists who make their name while they're studying. Art schools put on end-of-year exhibitions, and influential people regularly come in looking for talent. 
Your work is showcased in a way that just won't happen if you're working in isolation. Yes, yes, I do see all that. I'm just not convinced. I sometimes question the value of a creative course, full stop. I mean, I often feel almost guilty when I tell people that I'm studying art. <laughs> I see this look on their face as though they think I should be doing something more useful. I feel that if I get a studio and start working, at least I'd be paying my way. I think the key factor here is that being at art school exposes you to critical appraisal. Hmm. Perhaps the most essential function of further education is the constant feedback and constructive criticism. It's essential to personal development, no matter what the field is. Yes, we all know artists who paint as a hobby, people who have been doing it for years. They think they're experts and wonder why other people haven't recognised their talents. If only they'd become part of a creative community, they'd understand why that hasn't happened. Yes, I think Lily's right. It's important to keep developing and responding to feedback. Anyway, don't go making any rash decisions. Come and see me. And... That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to part four. Part four. You will hear a woman giving a lecture about the positive effects of laughter. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Listen carefully to the lecture and answer questions 31 to 40. Good morning, everyone. I do hope you didn't get too wet getting here this morning. The subject for my talk, I think we could all do with some to take our minds off this atrocious weather, is laughter. The laughter I want to look at is specifically related to psychological therapy and the treatment of physiological disorders, something we've been looking at over the last week or so. Now, when we start talking about psychological therapy, laughter isn't something that immediately springs to mind. Therapy is a serious business, and it's generally approached with an appropriate degree of seriousness. After all, people seek treatment and enter therapy for serious reasons. They're often at critical junctures in their lives, and they need professional help. The question is, how is it that laughter can be such a vital part of the therapy process? It's normally identified with humour, and thus generally deemed appropriate only in lighter, more frivolous circumstances, when it's acceptable to find a situation funny. Perhaps this is why so many people in the medical world feel that laughter's frequently misunderstood and undervalued as a cathartic, healing process. Now, humour certainly is one trigger for laughter, but it isn't the only trigger. If we take as a starting point the fact that laughter is a physical process that releases emotional pain, it follows that stress, anxiety and tension may prompt the same response. Psychologists frequently point out that humans don't laugh because they're happy. They're happy because they laugh. Once we accept that laughter and pain are related, we are less likely to be shocked when people laugh in all sorts of painful, even tragic situations.
Cathartic psychotherapy utilizes laughter as an essential medium for healing emotional pain. It's specific to the release of anger, fear and boredom. When people laugh, they free themselves of painful feelings. The amount of pain the body releases during a single burst of laughter is immeasurable. But we know that the body will keep discharging pain cathartically until there's no longer a need. The only obstacle to the process is the self-constraint we learn to impose on ourselves during our early years. We're taught the virtues of self-control from infancy, and any loss of that control during an emotional outpouring is discomforting. We fail to realise that when we lose control, we actually gain in many other ways. Our cultural preference for processing feelings cognitively, instead of feeling them physically, maintains and prolongs emotional distress. Patients who have had upbringings during which feelings were suppressed may have quashed their ability to laugh, cry and become angry. Clinicians can help individuals regain these cathartic processes, enabling them to release deep-rooted emotions that may be an obstacle to happiness. Only now has research begun to validate the notion that emotions are stored in the body rather than the mind. Recently developed cathartic techniques allow practitioners to teach patients how to access their hidden emotions and release them. The more catharsis the patient experiences, the more rapidly he or she progresses through the healing process. Laughter is probably the least threatening cathartic process, at least to the person expressing the laughter, and so it has an essential role. It's often a stepping stone to other forms of emotional release, like crying or showing rage. So why, you might ask, has the mental health community been so slow to accept laughter as a healing tool? Well, for reasons I've already outlined. Like any expression of the true self, laughter is radical and revolutionary, and laughing at what is seemingly misfortune upsets conformity. We in the medical professions must challenge the antiquated view that adult laughter is silly and inappropriate. We have to ensure that patients don't reject the healing power of their laughter in the fear that others will see them as making light of their issues. Traditionally, mental health practitioners have viewed laughter as a way of hiding painful emotion. In contrast, cathartic psychotherapy understands that laughter releases emotion. Through laughter, feelings erupt from within into the outside world. If people suppress laughter, they also stifle the release of pain. The catharsis of laughter doesn't change people's circumstances, but it does change the way people relate to those circumstances. It enables them to take a different view, a view from which terrible misfortune can seem so much more bearable. This allows people to remember, to feel, and to explore without fearing that they'll be trapped by what they can't control. Life's most tragic events often have an essence of absurdity, and this can be the trigger point for laughter. Some people deal with emotional pain instinctively and come along to therapy already laughing and crying. There are many others, however, that need assistance. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers. That is the end of the listening test. You now have 10 minutes to transfer your answers.